Alrighty, Benjamin here. I want to show you a uh, or how to do a modification to a Max Track radio. Now, some of you that have these things, but uh, they uh, may be only two channels, look like this. Now, I should answer the question first as why I'm even bothering with these old ass radios from, where's the sticker on here, from 1988. Well, a couple of reasons. First thing is they're free to $5, maybe $20 at a ham fest if they might work uh, or might known to be working. The other thing is, is that these radios are built like tanks. They actually have a legitimate receiver front end on it. So for a mobile installation or for a site with a lot of RF, um, that right there, in addition to other filtering, would be work. But just, just this right here alone is significantly more filtering or receiver front end filtering than a lot of other radios. And the other thing is, these things are just tanks, man. This one is going to be a, a link radio that's tied to a repeater. And uh, there's already one in service that I modified um, that it sees three hours of transmission a day with just a crappy little flan, fan blowing over the heat sink. The uh, power was knocked down from 45 watts to about 22, you know, keeping about 30% efficiency, so it's not all that great. But in any event, it still works. And despite all the electrical storms and things like that, it still works. So, a cheap tank. I like cheap tanks, and especially ones that are effective. So anyway, let's get right to it. What need to be modified to change it from a radio, like I said, that once began as a two-channel radio, uh, and turn it into 32. Well, first things first is I had to get a new logic board. So the original logic board is this one right here. It's the five pin. is It is a, a what they call a normal code block. It's not the extended. Um, you see some of the modifications I did to enable a couple different features. Um, so let's just go over this. See, this this is why I'm doing this. This is why we're. And this is how we're using these as link radios with at least a five pin. If you want to do that. So this jumper right here is to enable um, uh, for consistent PL decode and encode even with no mic. Okay. Another one of these is to have the mode button from the radio. Uh, so that way it can change channels. He's got a DTMF controller that allows him to, uh, an external DTMF controller that allows him to channel through the channels on the radio so he can change them. This right here on the 5 pin, because it does not have any accessories on the back for uh, core cost output and stuff like that, this right here is just pulled from the audio mute gate circuit. So same thing, when the radio detects either um, uh, carrier squelch, if, it, if the mode or channel does not have PL on it, it'll uh, go active high, about 6 volts. And because it is, it is audio gate, it's, if the channel has tone squelch on or DPL, same thing, this only sends five, uh, 6 volts through a 1K resistor out the front. And then, this, is, this wire goes from this pin, which is for um, audio that comes from uh, at, comes after the 300 hertz uh, 300 hertz high pass and 3 kilohertz low pass filters. So okay, it goes from there. So what did I have to do? Well, you have to use uh, obviously special software. I'll let you do the digging on that one, okay? Um, but you have to use special software, and there's a couple of things that has to be done. The logic board from whatever radio you're using has to be blanked, uh, and then you have to take the tuning data. Um, which on the RF board, the RF boards are going to be the same whether it's 2 channel, whether it's 32 channel that's in material um, the RF boards are going to be the same but you got to take the crystal data which is found here you got to take the, the PLL tuning data which is found here and then uh, leave the measured voltage at 9.6 volts so it just stays there now if you're going to move the radio significantly out of band um, this board was originally 146 to 174 megahertz or something like that whatever the high end is I don't care but these right here are your transmit and receive VCO filter or VCO uh, t um, tuning inductors these might need to get changed so how you check these 
is you tune it for your lowest frequency okay on this one right here the lowest receive frequency is 144 uh, 145.19 and then you tune on the SL point here okay and it's about uh, 2.2 volts good enough as long as it exceeds 1.5 so the highest receive frequency we want is 162.4, the weather station. Obviously that's blank in the, in the programming. We don't need to have any accidental boo-boos. Okay, that's 5 volts. So the receive VCO must be within 1.5 volts at your lowest and no more than 8. I think it's like 7.5 at your highest. That allows for the VCO tuning range. Um, let's see. This one... This, this filter right here adjusts the receive side. This filter right here adjusts your transmit. So when you test that, obviously you need to be connected to a dummy load, uh, like that one back there. Okay, you key the mic and then have another, have your probe testing on SL, which stands for steering line that goes to your VCO. You key the mic and you look at the meter. And as long as it says it's, uh, um, at your lowest transmit frequency it's above 1.5 and at your highest transmit frequency it's below uh, 8 volts then it should be fine anyway you enter in all that information save it and then just program it as normal um, obviously you'll have to re uh, retweak the um, the deviation with PL DPL and regular transmit you may have to adjust the frequency warp on it you know transmit warp uh, and if for one reason or another, if that fails a little secret Motorola does not use trimmer capacitors to adjust frequency warp or reference oscillator. Uh, that warp is, you know, just a little trimmer cap in there. Uh, if the if the VCO if the PLL reference crystal is not exactly on, so it uses this inductor here. They're all the same across just about all of them that I've ever come across. You just put your little ceramic tip, your little ceramic tip plug in there. So that way it's not inductive. It doesn't do anything and then you just very very slowly and very very carefully adjust it so it's on frequency but remember do the frequency warp inside the software first and remember to give it at least 10 to 15 seconds when you update it but other than that that's it if you have any questions please ask thanks